Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Shelby on Safari live stream in which I, a wild animal biologist, but also Pokemon trainer, explores the ever connecting world between Pokemon and our world. So let's get started tonight. It is on a different day, different time of night. I appreciate you guys showing up here. Whether you're watching live with me or in the comments, be sure to let me know. Uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. This live stream is very much interactive. I have pop quiz questions throughout and I love hearing from you and making new friends as well. Uh, with the recent 1K subscriber party, a few new friends have joined us. So welcome if you're new to the channel. I wouldn't be surprised if Maui doesn't interrupt. I didn't quite shut the door all the way. So <laughs> we might have a Maui interruption. Well, so there has been a lot going on in Pokemon Go. Uh, we recently had Helioptile join us, and I am very excited. Helioptile is rather adorable looking Pokemon, but I thought let's take a closer look at thermoregulation because Helioptile has a few unique things about it as a Pokemon. And it made me think of a lizard, a particular lizard that yes, Jody, if you're watching, I completely agree. I think it is definitely based off of this real life Pokemon in our world. However, there are some few major differences. So in tonight's live stream, we're gonna go through a few different things. First, we're gonna talk about thermoregulation. Oh yeah, gonna get some science in there for your Wednesday evening, might as well, might as well, or whenever you're watching this. Then we're gonna talk about Helioptile and the Pokedex. What do we know about it as a Pokemon? Maybe some of the things that we've seen in the anime as well. Then last but certainly not least, I'm gonna introduce you to an animal of our world that is certainly like a real life Pokemon. And <laughs> definitely one that reminds me of Helioptile. So with you guys joining me in the comments, let's see who's here. Ah, hello, Alice. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, darling. Thanks for joining. And I think you said Starkey was going to be with you as well. Very excited. Hello, Starkey Larky. Now, we are going to jump right into it. Let's see if... Ah, look at that. It worked. So, friends, here's where you can find me across the platforms. I apologize for not posting a reminder sooner. In fact, someone actually reminded me, a person named Alice, <laughs> about the live stream moving from Tuesdays to Wednesdays. So we're going to try this out for a bit. Let me know what you think. Um, if it works for you, new time, new date, whatever, we'll see how it goes. But alas, here we are. So find me here, 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 and here, and here. I feel like the genie in <laughs> Aladdin. Here, 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 here. These are all the different places. I'm more active on others like Instagram than I am on the others. Uh, but Discord is to be seen in the future. Uh, my manager, aka my sister, uh, she's been working on the Discord with me, so fingers crossed for a solid launch on that. But anyways, I digress. Let's move on, because we are talking, as I said, thermoregulation to begin with. Now, the best way to talk about thermoregulation is, of course, with the definition. And my computer screen is going off the charts. Hopefully, you guys are still seeing it. There we go. Let's calm down now. So for our definition of thermoregulation, it's essentially the control of internal body temperature. That's what we want. We want to regulate the temperature of ourselves. Oh, hi, Lucky L. Oh, oh, that's fine though. Enjoy playing snooker. That's exciting. I believe, I am not uh, terribly uh, knowledgeable of these things, but I believe snooker is kind of like pool. Am I right? I think so. Either way, have a lovely time. And uh, yeah, feel free to watch afterwards, my dear. Like you said, oh, you're very kind. Yes, we'll see you later, alligator. Well, so thermoregulation, before we get into Helioptile and a real life animal that is like a Pokemon, it is all about maintaining a stable temperature. And so we thermoregulate, Maui thermoregulates, which by the way, Safari Squad, uh, and a bunch of few other things. In fact, actually, before I digress much further, one last tidbit. I got something in the post today that is a very special Shelby on Safari merchandise, and I'm very excited, but I can't share in case it is spoiled. But after Valentine's Day, I will share with you this very special piece of Shelby on Safari merchandise. Um, 
I'm sorry I can't say more, but it involves Maui and I'm super stoked. Anyway, so thermal regulation, we do it, Maui does it, everybody does it, but we do it a little bit differently. And so I have two pictures on here, a cheetah, and yes, I said your name. You can come in here if you want. I heard him meow. Come on then. We're already getting distracted enough already in the first five minutes. No, you're gonna sit by the door? Fine, he's gonna sit by the door and look pretty. So I put two pictures up on here. We got a cheetah and a beard dragon. No, this is not Eddie or Rex, but I, I wish it was, but this picture was far better quality. Um, and these are generally the kind of two main examples we're gonna use when we talk about thermoregulation, because thermoregulation is not created equal, my friends. It is separated pretty much into two groups. First, we have our friends, the endotherms. And so the endotherms, classified by the cheetah, because I love cheetahs, and cheetahs are the focus of this Friday's video, which I'm so excited for you guys to see. Um, but cheetahs are endotherms. That pretty much means that they have physiological mechanisms to control their internal body heat. So long story short, they maintain their body temperature using heat that's generated within their body tissues. They, they can regulate their own body temperature. They don't rely on external factors, rely on internal factors. We will be obviously affected by external factors. So like today is quite cold and I'm a pansy. And so I needed to work to thermoregulate and there's ways that I can help myself um, behavioral or uh, functions that my body can do to try to help it. But we're pretty good on our own for the most part. We're not reliant on external sources to um, heat ourselves up, if you will. So, <laughs> glad snooker is easier than pool. Interesting. I'll have to check it out. Uh, I'm terrible at pool. But so that's endotherms. And surprise, we are endotherms. We're endothermic. Now, a pop quiz question, my friends in the chat, let me know, what do you think is not an example of how an endothermic animal regulates its temperature? Is it A, sweating, B, shivering, C, goosebumps, or D, none of these? All of these are ways of how an endothermic animal regulates its temperature. So remember, we are endotherms, and yes, we have to regulate our body temperature at some point. Which one of these is not? <laughs> is Rita an endotherm? Yes, Rita is an endotherm. Spoilers. Ah, yes, my friends, you are correct. Al, Al and Rita uh, both said D. <laughs> Rita is clarifying my poor use of English by saying yes, double negative. It is indeed D. None of these. So Hint, because we do these things to regulate our body temperature. You know, we sweat. And um, <laughs> Grace is a uh, FaceTime with me. Hold on. Let's see. Hi, Grace. I'm live. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> she hit her face. Oh, silly Grace. Um, Grace is of Otis B by G and guys, shout out to her because she put up with listening to my voice for last week's video, which was a vlog and shorten it down for everybody's sanity. So thank you, Grace. And I totally, <laughs> I love you, man. I love you, man. I love when that happens. That, you know, it reminds me of, um, I love watching behind the scenes and I know I'm getting distracted, but guys, I'm already gone. So I'm just going to roll with it. All right. Uh, <laughs> there was a panel, like I love watching panels of like my favorite TV shows and the actors and talking behind the scenes. Um, you know, Comic Con has a lot of those. And I really, really hope one day I'll be able to go to Comic Con and see one of these in person. But I was watching one, I think it was on Firefly, the TV show Firefly with Nathan Fillion. Oh, I love him. Uh, and yeah, it, one of the guys, he wasn't on the panel, but he called during the panel to one of the other actors and they answered the phone and they had him on. Like, I just loved it because it was really exciting to hear from him at the panel. I don't know why that reminded me of it, but it did remind me of it. And yes, Grace, I guess that makes you Nathan Fillion. You're welcome. Um, and let me know in the chat as well, if you like behind the scenes footage, because I feel like the oddball out, because in this household, it is an abomination 
to watch the behind the scenes stuff, but I love it. I love it. I got the Harry Potter DVD disc set for Christmas. Thanks guys. Uh, and I've been loving the behind the scenes features, which by the way, Studio 77, if you're watching this, uh, I'm looking for you. I'm going to be watching the creature creation one next and I'm going to be watching it. Um, yeah, Grace, I, I know you hate me, but oh look, her name's changed. Cruelty free gracefully. Nice name. Um, but yeah, check her out for all things cruelty free. Uh, I'm still going to call you on a speed by G though. I'll try to commit to the new name, but I can't guarantee it. Anyway, so you guys got this right <laughs> of how uh, it was a double negative. This is all things that we as endotherms, endothermic animals do. And obviously I know there's some exceptions to this, like some animals can't sweat. So what do they do? They pant. And, you know, there, it, it does vary, but these are just some examples and goose pumps, you know, that's one way. Uh, thermogenesis is the technical term of it, as we as, you know, uh, endotherms and ectotherms do it too, but essentially thermogenesis. I know I'm throwing a lot of cool terms here at you guys, but thermogenesis is the way to increase metabolic heat production when things get chilly. So it's the goosebumps, it's the shivering, it's our body you know, doing stuff to help keep us warm when things get chilly. So I will, <laughs> I love you guys. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you called. And what am I gonna do when my phone's buzzing on the table next to me? I'm just gonna answer it if it's you. Like, even if it was like my mom, I'd still be like, hey mom, I'm live. How's it going? <laughs> like, it's fine. Unless it was a cold caller. If I could tell it was a cold caller, then I'd be really upset. Um, but yeah, no, but you're fine. So with that in mind, thermoreceptors, um, to help us with this as endotherms, we have thermoreceptors that are found in our skin and the mucous membranes to help detect external temperatures, both hot and cold. And these thermoreceptors then communicate with, I don't know why it's still on that. I'm gonna come back to being big. Uh, these thermoreceptors then communicate with something called the hypothalamus. Yeah, so that might sound familiar to our friends uh, who like brains. That sounds off. <laughs> that sounds off. <laughs> With the hypothalamus, yes, is part of the brain, um, and the hypothalamus gets things into motion. So if our thermal receptors say, "Dude, it's getting cold out because it's England and it's winter and it's freezing," and Shelby didn't dress appropriately for work today because she thought it was warmer, um, and the thermal receptors go, "Ooh, we got to warm her up." Then they send the message to the hypothalamus, who then gets into motion the physiological response of shivering to the uh, changing to help mediate and keep me warm uh, because of the changing external temperatures. So it, it's quite an interesting process. And if you're keen on it, I highly recommend you look into it because it's so crazy to hear, especially like I know I talk a lot about animals, but this does apply to us, too, obviously, as endothermic animals. But just how we, the way our body works is fantastic. And especially, you know, with things like this to help regulate our temperature when it's cold or even when it's hot, you know, sweating. I know it's gross, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do to help stay. Yeah, brain, good vibes. That's right. That's right. So there, that's a bit of endothermic chat for you. So we are endotherms uh, as well as cheetahs, you know, mammals, birds, friends like that. Now getting to the cold blooded side of things, which is not really an accurate name. So if you do say, oh, you're cold blooded. No, I'm not thinking of the song by Foreigner, although it's a good song, but cold blooded uh, doesn't really do justice to our friends, the ectotherms represented by here. And when I say here, that's cue to myself to put the PowerPoint slide <laughs> you here to our lovely bearded dragon uh, who is a fine example of an ectotherm and so ectotherms are the opposite to us they regulate their body temperatures by absorbing heat from the environment so they're really dependent on the external sources because they internally can't do anything about it whereas we as endotherms can so again ectotherms depend on absorbing heat from the environment rather than metabolic heat. So metabolic the stuff that we can do. Now within this, there's a fair few kind of behavioral mechanisms that they can do to help support this because as being dependent on external sources, 
you know, like moving to a heat source and sunbathing on a rock uh, and being in the sun, things like that. Yes, like Lilo and Stitch, uh, tortoises. In case you were wondering, not <laughs> not Lilo uh, in Stitch uh, Experiment 626, but fine, fine tortoise friends. Um, and so there's the behavioral side of things, but then there's also physiological uh, mechanisms that ectotherms can do to help deal with the changing circumstances in the weather. One of these things is, and I'm wondering if I'm getting ahead of myself, um, no, I'll just put up another picture of a bearded dragon. One of the cool things that ectotherms can do is torpor. Yay! Um, and shout out to future Shelby for putting in a tag up here so you all can check out the video if you didn't already on hibernation. And I mentioned three unique species that you may not have heard of, including a bird that technically hibernates, which is crazy. Um, and torpor is a state where the body kind of is like, whoa, hang on, there's something going on, we need to drop our metabolism and keep you alive, kind of thing. Um, and yes, this can be seen in both endotherms and ectotherms. And as we know, if you've watched the video, it's not just in winter, it can happen in summer as well. Uh, and we will dive actually more on that in just a bit. But these guys can do that, they can you know, go into a state of torpor to deal with some gnarly atmospheric things that are happening. But behavioral is key. And I mean, I think of my bearded dragons. And actually, I think it's in my very first video that's published on YouTube. Highly recommend you don't check it out um, unless you want a good laugh and like Grace and who's going to want <laughs> not too happy with me. Um, you can watch that for solid good time because uh, I spray myself in the face to represent kind of sweating. Um, yeah, classic humor, right? And I talk about some of the things like the beard dragons do to help kind of regulate their temperature. And so Rexy is a fine example because she actually changes color. So when she's cold, like when um, she hasn't had her light on and I go downstairs or if I haven't put her outside yet, uh, when it's warm enough for me to put her outside, she's quite dark in color. Um, and then with light, when she is warmed up, she does actually lighten in color. And so obviously dark in the hopes to attract sunlight. Um, and then when she does get quite warm, her color does kind of fade a bit. Um, she also, you know, she has a favorite rock that she likes to sit on. Um, and the rock actually happens, you know, so holds a lot of heat. And so little things like that. But at the same time, that's to warm up. But when it gets too hot, they can obviously book it and move and go someplace else. And so, you know, being by a body of water, that is one way that both kind of endotherms and ectotherms, you know, have access if they're near water to be able to cool off. That's one way that I like to cool off when it gets too hot, like when I'm in Palm Desert, <laughs> and eventually I get to go back to California, you know, it when it hits, oh God, I don't know the uh, Celsius, but it can get really hot. I'd say 40 degrees Celsius, um, well over 95 degrees Fahrenheit in Palm Desert. And, you know, walking from the hotel room to the pool, you're like drenched in sweat by the time you get there. And I don't know how people, sit outside in the sun when it gets that hot. Like I need to be in a body of water. Um, and <laughs> equally, I guess maybe I'm more of an ectotherm than an endotherm in some extent, because I really, really rely on heat. Uh, I really don't do well in the cold. But anyways, yes, how do they know how hot they are? That's a very good question. And I think, I know when I see Rexy, um, she actually kind of, when she hits prime optimal temperature, she actually opens her mouth um, and it looks like she's taking a big yawn, but she's just kind of exhaling in a sense. Um, and that when she gets to that temperature, I, I imagine it has something to do with the hypothalamus, Rita. Uh, I'm not for certain, but knowing how the body communicates to the hypothalamus, I imagine it has something to do that, like that where the body's like, okay, we've had enough, move away. Um, to protect them because equally that's a really good point because if a reptile does get too hot you need they need to have the ability to find somewhere cool and so as a zoo scientist um when you have an enclosure 
you need to have that gradient of temperatures for all reptiles. So this is tortoises, this is beard dragons, this is for snakes. You need to have an area in part of the enclosure. I don't know why I'm so small. You need to have an area in part of the enclosure where their light, their heat source, that warm area is, but then equally as important is that gradient. So I think that's one of the reasons why, like with reptiles, it's really, really important. And amphibians, actually. You need to be mindful of your setup with that. You can't just put a light in any old place. You have to be very mindful of where you put it and make sure you have the cool area because, like you said, the body, you know, will alert them saying, okay, you need to move. Uh, and it will happen kind of subconsciously, I guess. You know, kind of like what happens with us when we're like, ooh, it's cold. Our body starts shivering. We don't think, ooh, I need to shiver. It just happens. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point, Rita, um, and definitely an area to look into. But from that conversation, mostly, you know, that thermal gradient of having that available for our reptiles um, and doing your research ahead of time to make sure before you get one that you know the setup and can make that happen for them. So they have that opportunity to go back and forth. And I have seen that, you know, with my own animals and in zoos, you know, they do use their enclosure. And I think especially, sorry, I knocked my computer, um, but especially like with snakes, it's so key to be able to not just assume, oh, they're Is that better? The sound got too hot and moved to a cold area. Yeah, my mic said, jump ship. I literally reached over because I saw my computer was like on zero battery and I was like, oh, oh my God, it's gonna go. And then um, I had the charger up here and everything, but yet I didn't plug it into the computer. I'm a doofus, thanks guys. Uh, but yeah, Jason, I agree. I think, can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, cool, thanks Jason. Um, but yes, too long didn't read filmmaker Jason. I firmly agree. Yeah, 72. Solid choice. All right. Oh, my God. Ken's here too? Good Lord. The whole team's here. Uh, hello, Ken. How are you? What is your prime optimal temperature? Let me know in the chat. Uh, we know Jason's 68 to 72. If you can convert it into Fahrenheit and Celsius, please feel free to do so. Um, but yeah, Ken, it's nice to see you. I spoilers for Friday's video. Uh, it's the start of the series in which my friends from around the world will be helping me out uh, in some respect by asking me their questions. So I'm very excited for you guys to meet them. Um, you may see them often in the chat and in a few of the videos and live streams, uh, like Cruelty Free Gracefully has popped into a few of them and uh, got more coming up in the future. But here we are. Alas, there we go. I, it was coming. I was trying to fight it, but it didn't work. All right. So let's now go back. So Ken, Jason, you guys missed us talking thermoregulation, even though I got distracted. So how animals, and uh, including ourselves, regulate one's body temperature. That's why I asked you about your optimal temperature, because we've seen that endotherms, like ourselves, we can do it internally. We don't need to rely on external sources. Uh, we ha have a way of, you know, producing our own, uh, generating our own kind of heat eternally. Um, I didn't get too much in the science of that, but with our ectotherms, I talked about how they do have to rely on the external sources. And so that's why sometimes, you know, they can go into a state of torpor, hibernation, which uh, reference back to previous video from a few weeks ago, but also the heat, they need heat. And so therefore, 
that reminded me of a friend, a Pokemon friend. And after I introduce this Pokemon friend, we're going to meet an animal that is like a real life Pokemon. Even better, dare I say, hot take than Helioptile. So here we are, Helioptile, this adorable, interesting looking Pokemon. It's actually an electric and normal type known uh, to be rather timid, especially in the anime. Uh, you see it, it's uh, the buddy of, oh God, what's her name? She's like a photographer, video lady. I was really jealous because I was like, oh, that sounds like the dream job is going around making Pokemon documentaries on the back of a go-goat. Uh, but yeah, Helioptile, super, super sweet looking, but really exciting because it's finally come into Pokemon Go. I was waiting forever for a new Pokemon to be released. Um, not ever, really, but still long enough. But Helioptile, very adorable, really interesting kind of evolution side, but some really weird quirks that we're going to dive into. So these things on the side, while we may think they, <laughs> they look like ears, chat, calm down. I... <laughs> I'm I'm afraid of you having power. That's why I gave you and Alice both power, because I know with great power comes great responsibility. Cheers. Best movie ever. Fight me if you say differently. Come on. Come at me. My God. I don't want to go into too many spoilers, but holy Toledo, Spider-Man No Way Home. Look, at, I'm getting flushed just talking about it, but luckily you can't see me because I'm so small on the screen. Um... The helioptile, these things aren't actually ears. They're, I, I think of them as flaps, but technically they're referred to as frills. And so they can stiffen and expand uh, kind of to, as a defense mechanism, but for a few other things as well. Most importantly, these frills actually have the, um, the capability to generate electricity when exposed to sunlight, which I thought was Pretty interesting of a choice by the Pokemon creators. Uh, this allows Helioptile to then create its own energy and not even really need food. It can thrive without food in its desert home from these frills, which I thought is pretty cool. And it made me think of like the frills acting as mini solar panels, which is just crazy. Look at her cute little face. Um, bit happier there. So now first time for some trivia. Helioptile is the only Pokemon with a base stat total of 289. I know that's not really relevant to most of you, but I know a few of you will find that interesting. I thought it was interesting. But we do have a question here that is for all of you. I, Rita, you still haven't seen it? Rita still hasn't seen Spider-Man Spider No Way Home. That, bring, that brings such painfulness to my heart. Um, we need to sort that out. I can't believe it. Um, and I'm glad I didn't go into spoilers. Uh, yes, I know. Anyways, chat friends, true or false, Helioptile is the only non-grass type Pokemon to evolve using a sunstone. Interesting, interesting. Because yes, for many Many of my Pokemon friends, even in Pokemon Go, you know, we have the Sunstone available to us to evolve Pokemon. Is Helioptile the only non-grass type to evolve using a Sunstone, or are there a few other exceptions? Oh, we got a... <laughs> we got a harsh, harsh false. Oh, we got another false. Lots of falsies coming in. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Not sure. Well, friends, I hate to break it to you, but it is indeed true. Helioptile is, in fact, the only non-grass type Pokemon to evolve using a Sunstone. Now, I know, hot take, I don't know if this will change in Pokemon Legends Arceus. I have been a firm believer, as with many things, to not get into spoiler territory. I've been spoiled a little bit, but not a lot. But I don't go actively seeking spoilers for those things. Um, so who knows? That might have changed. But as far as my knowledge goes, um, <laughs> the sundial dude did. Are you referring to Helioptile? Is it its evolution? Find out the name of this Pokemon, please. Cruelty free, gracefully. And let me know. Sundial dude Pokemon. Who is that? Who is that? I'm not sure. But anyways, 
Helioptile, as we've seen, does evolve uh, using the Sunstone and in Pokemon Go with some candies to um, Helios, Heliolisk, Heliolisk, there we go. Uh, but Helioptile, look at him go, using his frills to generate electricity. Very interesting frill shape as well, might I add. Uh, but now, my amigos, this comes the time where we will talk about a real life animal that I think is certainly like a Pokemon, if not cooler. And Jody, I know Jody, you often watch live streams. You <laughs> mentioned this a while ago about Helioptile being like the frill neck lizard. Now, I have to agree with you uh, for many different reasons, uh, some more interesting than others, but as we can see, uh, in just a moment, I want to linger on, I don't want to linger on that picture because I obviously removed the PowerPoint from the slide. But as we'll see, the frill neck lizard is definitely a sight to behold and a very weird lizard at that. And I'm so excited to introduce it to you guys. You probably have seen it in, you know, a few bits and pieces across the internet, maybe in some memes. But this animal is so strange and so cool. And there are some really deep cuts. You all know I love a deep cut when it comes to Pokemon in our world and little nuggets of uh, glory? Nuggets of glory <laughs> in the Pokedex. My favorite one, though, has to be with Vulpix. Actually, no, I think tonight's nugget of glory is better than the KOKO KO nugget of the Alolan Vulpix, which, by the way, if you haven't seen that video, again, one of my earlier ones, so I apologize, but um, I'll pop a link to it in the description below. I actually think this one might top it, and you'll see why. So, my friends, we are going to go now and meet the wonderful Frill Neck Lizard. Look at that beauty! Um, and this lizard is an arboreal lizard that's found in Australia. Now, when I say arboreal, I mean arboreal, uh, no, because, well, they hang out in trees. Roughly about 90% of their time is spent in trees, which I don't know about you, but I think that's crazy for a lizard. Like, I, I know I'm surrounded by my beardies, and, you know, they can be fast, you know, after warming up, as we've seen with thermoregulation, you know, when they're cold, when they haven't been in the sun, haven't had their light on, you know, they're a bit bit slower, takes them a bit of time to move. But once they get warmed up, gee golly whiz, do they move quick. Um, but I, I don't often think of them as being arboreal in the sense, whereas these guys truly are with 90% of their time. Now, let's take a closer look. You all see that thing on the top right hand side of your screen, the scientific name. Right? I often put these up and I try to put them up as often as I can because it really helps uh, if, say, I'm talking about one species that's similar to another. The scientific name makes it clear cut, simple, which animal I'm talking about, especially with an animal like this, the frill neck lizard, because they go by a few different names. Frilled lizard, frill neck lizard, whatever, tomato, tomato. Scientific name, that tells you what I'm talking about. So the first part of this scientific name actually comes from the Greek, and shout out to Tiff from A Girl in Her Passport. Uh, I know she's lately been dealing with snow. Talk about thermoregulation. Gee golly whiz, she needs her parka. She's probably shivering. Um, but the klamis comes from the Greek word meaning cape or cloak, which shouldn't really come as a surprise given by this picture of how beautiful this reptile is. Now, the second part of the scientific name, king, the king part, you might be thinking, ah, king, regal, glory. Actually, no. It comes, speaking of uh, Mr. Parker, it comes from uh, a gentleman by the name of Philip King Parker, who was an admiral in the British Navy in the 1800s. Y'all knew I had to throw a little bit of history in there. Uh, so yes, not a Peter Parker, but a Philip King Parker. And gosh, wouldn't that be so cool to have your name be part of an animal's name? I know Sir David Attenborough has like five different things named after him, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, I don't know. I like that little bit. Little, little nugget of joy. Now, relative to their body size, and I guess this is one of the things that make them stand out kind of as a real Pokemon, and we can kind of see some similarities to Helioptile and its evolution of using those frills, you know, out on the side. Obviously, Helioptile, the Pokemon, uses it a bit more for electricity, whereas this frilled lizard, they use it for different things. Um, but relative to their body size, they actually have one of the largest display structures in the animal kingdom, which makes them quite unique. 
Um, and also the frills, that's really unique as well within the animal kingdom. So these guys are kind of in a league of their own, one might say. Um, now this can sometimes lead to misidentification within uh, Australia. Uh, these guys are more in the north, uh, but bearded dragons, like my little friend Rexy, they're kind of central south part of Australia. And sometimes people can see a bearded dragon and um, I don't know, I don't have a picture of it, but when bearded dragons, they're named beards, bearded, excuse me, bearded dragons because they can puff out um, and the beard, you know, it, it's not a frill, but it's on the lower half of their body. Sometimes people think, oh, that's a frill blizzard. And it's like, no, it's a bearded dragon. Um, so the frill versus beard is a little different, um, but beardies can puff out as well, which is quite interesting to see. Apologies, I didn't put a picture in. Um, but speaking of frills and what they're used for, so I mentioned Helioptile, the Pokemon, uses their frills to generate electricity, and in doing so, they can thrive in the desert without eating. Our guys, I mean, frill lizards, can't quite do that, but they do use their frills for something different. Now, in the early days uh, of science and studying lizards, uh, they they thought these frills could be used for thermoregulation or used for gliding, of all things. They had a bunch of different theories that they thought that these frills were used for, but one particular study actually found they watched these lizards for a long time, and they revealed that the frills are primarily used for communication with other lizards and to uh, deter predators. Because I don't know about you, but if I go back to that picture, like, woo-wee, I ain't going to want to mess with that, you know? <laughs> um, but also communication with other frilled lizards, which I thought was interesting. Now, my question to you guys, with that in mind, knowing that they're used for communication, but also to deter predators, do you think, true or false, only male frilliz frilled lizards have frills. What do you think? <laughs> I've just seen your message. <laughs> Polar opposites. Yes, I think indeed we would have bigger issues at hand if frilled lizards were able to generate <laughs> electricity from their frills like helioptile. Uh, yeah, that would, that would be quite interesting indeed. Now, frilled lizards, males only have frills, or do females? What do we think? I know there's a lot of examples of sexual dimorphism in the animal kingdom. In fact, I actually did a video on that with Pokemon, which was rather interesting. Uh, but with these guys, it's actually false. Both male and female frilled lizards have frills, which is quite cool. Um, again, they use it to communicate with other lizards. But obviously, there is some form of sexual dimorphism in terms of size. But on the whole, they both, males and females, have the frills. Now, one of my favorite things of wisdom, nuggets of glory, I think I refer to them as, within the Pokedex, is in terms of the classification. So these guys are part of a family. Um, known as the dragon family in terms of classification. So, you know, we have the scientific name of uh, the frilled lizard. Within that kind of taxonomic classification, there is the agamids or the agamidae uh, is the technical term for this family. It's known as the dragon family, which I think could be a subtle nod to helioptile being classed in the dragon egg breeding group which I thought that's a really like weird thing for Helioptile to be in like that dragon A kind of breeding group to begin with. And then I thought, oh my God, they're Agamids. Like that makes sense because that's known as the dragon family. Um, and so Agamids, uh, the group of kind of lizards that are known as Agamids and classified into that family, they're a bit different than say my leopard gecko, uh, Skit, for example because agamids are unable to drop parts of their tail and say, you know, if their tail was broken, perhaps, uh, they wouldn't be able to grow it back and it wouldn't regenerate. They couldn't do a Doctor Who and <laughs> regenerate their tail. So agamids are quite unique lizards uh, and these beautiful guys, the frilled neck lizards, are part of that family. Um, so I thought that was a really cool 
Easter egg shout out, quite literally an egg shout out because of the classification and helioptiles uh, breeding group classification. Now, here's another cool picture for you guys. I mentioned, obviously, in the beginning, we talked about thermoregulation, and I threw in the word torpor again. Um, but remember, you know, from the previous Friday video from two weeks ago, I believe, uh, do you remember the word estivation? So I didn't talk too much about this, but I did mention how estivation is kind of like hibernation, but in the summer. Because I know when we think of hibernation, we think winter, we think cold, we think bears, but estivation is it essentially kind of hibernation, but in the warmer months. Now, these beautiful, beautiful frilled neck lizards have been known to climb into the canopy of a tree. We know they're quite arboreal, so they're quite able to do so. I mean, look at those claws on that beautiful friend. You know, they're quite confident in the trees, but they've been known to climb into the canopy of a tree during the dry season. And if food is scarce, they will stay up there in that tree chilling quite literally for as long as three months um and in doing this that process of estivation they will drop their metaslam by as much as 70 percent and with dropping their metaslam that much they're kind of it, it is essentially kind of hibernation in the summer but because they're able to do that and just kind of chill in the treetops not have to do anything else um, they're going to be able to survive kind of the food shortage that's going on around them. And so even the, it, it's great to see examples of endotherms and ectotherms both being able, you know, to do some crazy feats like this to survive. And it just makes me wonder of uh, <laughs> the wonders of the world. Good point, Rita. Uh, he wants a word with the person who named the species. Uh, chances are they probably named it after themselves. I don't know. Or by someone they're inspired by. I do wonder why it was named after that, that guy. That's interesting. Uh, but yes, amazing feats of our friends, the frilled neck lizards. And I, it's just the wonders of the world and the real life world of Pokemon that literally surrounds us with lizards like the frilled neck lizard who not only have those impressive frills but are you know adept at climbing they can drop their metabolism to survive kind of food shortages they're just really cool animals and I guess that's one of the reasons why I really love sharing with you guys whether in live stream or in videos the amazing world of animals that are like some of the things that are near and dear to your hearts from pulp culture, like Pokemon, Animal Crossing, things like that. Actually, it makes me want to ask you guys because I'm all for talking Pokemon, like I could talk Pokemon all day, don't get me wrong, but are there any other pulp culture fandoms that you'd like me to tackle in a few upcoming videos? For example, I know that Harry Potter, I haven't really, uh, I don't know, I don't want the haters coming at me for this one, but uh, Harry Potter, the new series, uh, I was quite bummed with what they did with Newt, not gonna lie, I had high hopes for Newt, um, but the Dumbledore thing. Anyways, I wanna look into the Harry Potter kind of creatures uh, I don't know if you guys would be interested in that and seeing how some of those things might work in our world and some cool magical creatures of our world. Uh, also, Avatar The Last Airbender, I'm a huge fan of that show, and I know Netflix is doing a series, a live action series in the future, so I'd be happy to talk about some of the cool animals within that universe as well. Um, if you have any kind of pulp culture fandoms you'd like to see me kind of dabble in and combined with the animals of our world, do let me know in the chat. I'm always up to hearing from you guys, or you can message me on Instagram. Always up, always up for new adventures. Uh, just as a heads up for the next few weeks on the channel, I will be doing the series Why Though with some of my friends. And yes, it's after the meme, Why Though? Because why not? <laughs> and uh, I'll be answering their questions uh, as a friend, uh, often in the group chat, animal questions come through and so I'll be starting off answering uh, one of my friend's questions about cheetahs because I can't think of a better way to start off a series than by talking about cheetahs. And uh, yeah, and then I'll be after that series, after a few videos with that, 
I'll actually be able to be going to some zoo collections and take you guys along with me and show you some of the amazing um, things that zoos are doing, maybe even be able to talk about some of their conservation work, things like that. Uh, so yeah, a little travel vlog, but lots of exciting stuff happening. And so thank you so much for joining me on this live stream evening. I appreciate the time was different and the date was different, but thank you to those of you in the chat and thank you to those uh, who are going to be watching on replay. Much appreciated. Good luck catching a Helioptile on Pokemon Go if you haven't already. Please be sure to do that quick and use your Sunstone as we see to evolve it into Heliosk. Uh, but yeah, with that, thanks so much, guys. And Rita and I love cats. I can't think of a better way to end the live stream with cats. I'm actually quite upset that Maui didn't interrupt. Um, he used to interrupt every live stream. That was the gig. That's why I made the Safari Squad and Maui on Safari mug because that was the running joke because Maui always would interrupt and even during filming but now I think he's getting a little camera shy but if you want your own little bit of merchandise Shelby on Safari mugs or better yet the Peter the alas Peter canvas bag probably my favorite piece of shameless merchandising when I'm walking around I carry this bad boy with me everywhere but yeah you can find it in the description down below but anyways I'm off to make some dinner. Got stir fry cooking. So excited. Have a good evening. Oh, hi, Angela. Oh, she loves my kitty. Oh, thanks. I wish they would come and see you. Maui. I can see his shadow literally on the other side of my door. Maui, come on. Diva. Diva. That's what he is. Anyways, if you actually want to see, this is going to be really, really shameless. But <clears throat> let me prepare myself. Angela, if you want to see more of my cats and some of my behind the scenes adventures, including upcoming tips and tricks into the latest videos, be sure to follow me over on Instagram at Shelby on Safari. There we go. I felt like a total TV uh, shameless personality. But really, though, Angela, if you want to see more of the cats, that's all my Instagram is is my cats. On that note, have a good evening, everybody, or a good day wherever you're at in the world. And I will see you all in Friday's video in which we're going to actually pop on over to Japan really quick to hear what my friend Ken wants to learn about cheetahs. Alrighty. See you guys then. Have a good night. Bye.